Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody out there. Um, just a real quick check. I want to make sure everyone can hear me and see me before we uh, get started. So in that little uh, question box down there in the corner, if you could just give me a shout, let me know that everything's good. Uh, we, saw, we also have uh, David Grover here. David, can you hear me? Yes, I can, loud and clear, so it's looking good. There he is. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we had a webinar earlier with a few quality issues in terms of the technical delivery, but I think we flushed them out. Uh, as you can see here, I have my very elegant solution of webcam over camera, so I can give you guys a little bit of a hands-on demo. Uh, so today, what uh, we're hoping to do is just go over a few features of the XF camera system that are lesser known, um, features that uh, are in the camera, but very few people will use them in their uh, usual workflow. So I've got a few examples that I'll show you on the camera, uh, showing you the digital back display um, and how the tools work, as well as the camera display and how you can uh, change the tools. And then David's going to take the images that I'll show you from the digital back display, open them up in Capture One, take over the webinar, and kind of go through the, uh, you know, how those tools in the XF and the IQ back translate into Capture One to just help improve your workflow. So. Hope that sounds enticing to everybody. Uh, and throughout, uh, if you have any uh, questions, just holler them out uh, through the, the questions panel. And uh, when David takes over, I'll go through them all and see which ones we can answer at the end. So away we go. Um, I trust that everyone can see the, uh, the preview screen that I have behind me, um, so it's a little bit more clear on your computer at home. And. Um, really what I want to emphasize here is the XF camera system is built to uh, work, which is good, and built to grow. Um, and these are the main tools that I'm going to go over. Power management might not sound that exciting of a uh, feature to really go through, but I'm just going to show you some of the finer points on how it might help to uh, streamline your workflow. Um, the OneShot AE is a very fantastic feature, feature that's, uh, that's uh, often overlooked, so we'll hopefully uh, entice some of you XF owners out there to uh, start using that feature and how it can benefit your workflow. Um, the hyperfocal focus. We've gone over in a previous webinar about what the hyperfocal focus tool is and how it can be used, but I want to illustrate uh, kind of the adaptability of that tool and how you can use it uh, throughout a multitude of uh, workflow scenarios so that it can improve uh, your workflow with the XF camera system. The last two are uh, IQ digital back features. These are for the IQ2 and the IQ3. Um, and these are features that uh, are the digital back is doing the bulk of the processing. Um, so even if you have an IQ2 and an IQ3 on you know, a technical camera or a Hasselblad H or a Hasselblad V, um, these camera tools, these uh, IQ tools will still work for you. Uh, and again, David will show you how they uh, come into Capture One. So. Power management, how exciting. Um, power management for the XF uh, is, it can be very complicated or it can be very simple. Uh, the power management is set up in a way that you can customize how the camera is utilizing power, uh, how it's getting power if you're shooting tethered, um, so that it can really give you an efficient workflow for the digital back, the camera, the two together. Uh, the camera system has two batteries that are both 34 milliamp uh, batteries, uh, and it's power on demand. So if you're using the digital back to preview your images or you're using the tools in there, zooming in, zooming out, um, that power is going to come from the digital back. That has the added advantage of you know, taking that digital back off and putting it on a technical camera uh, or whatever you need, a 4x5 for the studio, and still having access to, uh, to those tools and, of course, still having an elegant power solution. No uh, external cabling is necessary. Um, just one battery in the digital back to give you all of the uh, advantages that the digital back tools can offer. Excuse me while I wet my whistle. The camera body itself has its own battery, a 34 milliamp again. And what that does is it really gives the, the camera body the power it needs to activate the shutters, to drive the autofocus, um, without having to drain the digital back. There's power sharing between those two components so that the, the two can use 6,800 milliamps of power and ensure that everything's working as efficiently as possible. So um, we're going to try and move over here to this other camera. Bear with me. So here we go. Just got to take the lens off for a moment. So in the digital back itself, in the menu, under IQ settings, 
we have here the power management option. Now you'll notice there's, there's quite a few um, options in there. Uh, it can be as, again, complex or as simple as you would like. Um, charging from PC, it's not that we don't enjoy Macs, it's just a generic term. Um, let me move that over so you can, it doesn't get in the way of the text. Uh, so all that's doing is uh, if you're shooting tethered, it's going to grab as much power as possible from the camera system to ensure the batteries are topped off. So if you're using FireWire, uh, it's going to have up to 24 volts of power from your computer, depending on which camera or computer system it is, in order to deliver it to the digital back that can then charge the battery in the digital back, as well as charge the battery in the camera body. Um, so if you go in here, you have uh, slow and fast. So what is the difference? Well, if you have a computer system that's delivering adequate power, but not uh, an abundance of power, you would want to put the charging on slow. And what that means is it'll just take a little bit of power, but not interrupt the stability of your tethered connection. If you have, uh, for example, uh, a PC uh, with a FireWire 800 board that has its own independent power source going directly to the power supply of the PC, odds are you're going to have plenty of power. Uh, so you can just use the fast charging option. It'll make sure that it's delivering an abundance of power to charge your digital back. So that's really for a tethered workflow. But then you have the other common options. So auto power down, of course, every camera has that when the, the camera system will turn off. Then you have power off with camera. What that means is it's just tying the, the power button on the camera to control the digital back. So if I turn off the camera body, it'll also turn off the digital back. When might you want to change that? Well, if I'm out in the field and I'm shooting, but then I get back in the car uh, and I want to go through my images on the screen of the digital back, I can turn that uh, feature to off, I can turn off the camera body, the digital back will stay on, and I can rip through all my images and get an idea of uh, what I actually shot. And then we have this power share option. So power share is, of course, just the power from the digital back and the camera body together. Um, one's topping off the other, whichever one's being uh, used the most is getting power from the other. So the digital back options, um, they're, they're pretty complicated uh, if you need them to be, but again, you can simplify it and just use one or two options so that it's meeting your workflow. Um, the other power option that I wanted to show here is on the actual camera body itself. So on the camera body itself, if you go down all the way down here to the second to last menu item, power management, if you go in here, you have the options again to auto power down. For the purposes of this demonstration, I, of course, have it set to never, so it doesn't shut off while I'm trying to teach everybody about it. And then we have this peculiar setting. So mirror position down or mirror position auto. So what does that mean? So if I have the camera system and I'm out shooting, uh, this is the default setting, by the way, auto, and I'm out shooting and I turn off the camera system, just so you can see here, um, you can see through the actual uh, viewfinder uh, ground glass, and if I turn off the camera body, the mirror goes up. You can no longer see through it. So what does that do? When I turn off the camera body, it's going to put the mirror up, it's going to lock the uh, shutter down, and it's going to put the camera system in the most secure scenario for travel. It is a big mirror, uh, and it can move around if it's a bit rugged, so having that go to uh, the off position up um, whenever you power down the camera is incredibly advantageous. Uh, for the safety and security of the camera system, and that's why it's a default setting. However, in that power management option, we have mirror position down. So why would we have mirror position down as an option? Well, if I turn off the camera body now, I still have the mirror down, which means that while the camera is powered off, I can have the prism on the camera, and I can go ahead and frame my shots without ever having to turn the camera system on to do so. So this really uh, you know, translates well to a scenario for landscape photographers or travel photographers. If you don't want to bring you know, half a dozen batteries with you, you just have the two that are in the camera, you can have the camera system off, you can compose your shot through the viewfinder, and then you can go ahead and turn it on and then take your frame. So it's just a way to uh, ensure that the camera can do what you want it to do, when you want it to do it. When it's off, I can still utilize the viewfinder uh, and frame my shot. So, that sums up the, uh, the gist of the power management options. Of course, there are quite a few uh, other options that are available to you in power management, but those are the, the, the ones that are often overlooked, just the, the charging setup, 
um, the sharing setup, whether or not I power down the digital back and it turns off the camera, turn off the camera, it powers down the digital back. And then again, the ability to have the mirror down, I can look through my prism at all times, even when the camera's off. And as a fun fact, that uh, that little tip came from uh, a POTUS workshop where a photographer didn't want to have to keep turning it on to frame up his shots. So, of course, we listened to our beautiful users and we implemented it. So, moving on down the line, uh, one shot AE. What is one shot AE? One shot AE is simply a way for the camera system to activate the meter and automatically change your settings, uh, be it shutter, aperture, or ISO, uh, at the touch of a button. So we've all gotten in the terrible habit with digital photography of not properly metering the, the scene. Uh, we pitch up, we put an exposure in there that we think is pretty good, and of course we're all well-versed photographers, so nine times out of ten it's ballpark excellent. But um, rather than take a shot, look, adjust, take a shot, look, the one-shot AE allows you to simply push a button, it'll activate the meter, and the camera will automatically change the adjustments that you wish it to, it to change to give you a neutral exposure. So again, let me uh, change my cameras here, and I'll try and demonstrate that for you real quick. So here we have camera system, and I'll put a lens on there so that little red blinking will go away. So we have our camera system, we have our shutter speed, and we have our aperture value. And let's say it's a standard sunny day, right? And I figure this is going to be the, the proper exposure. Now, the old workflow would be to simply take that shot and then flip my camera over, look at the digital back, check my histogram. But with the one-shot AE, you have the ability to simply push one button, and the camera automatically finds an exposure that fits the scenario. So in this uh, dark impromptu studio, that's choosing a tenth of a second at f2.8. So if we just go in here to the menu, if you go to capture setup, and then you go down to auto exposure, you have the one shot AE options. And this just tells the camera when you activate the one shot AE feature, which values is it going to change? Is it going to change my aperture, my shutter speed, or my ISO? So by default, it'll only change the shutter speed. So if we use that as the default settings, we go back to the UI setup, and we assign a button to actually use the one-shot AE. In this case, uh, by default, your front focus, your front button is going to be your stop down. So by default, this will stop down the lens. So if I go back and go here. You can hear the lens stopping down. So that's my front button. But if I change that to one shot AE, when I go back to the screen, I make the adjustments that I think are appropriate for the scene. And I want to shoot at F8. If I push that front button, which is this button here, if I push that front button, the camera automatically finds an exposure that will give me a neutral, right there in the middle, uh, neutral exposure for the scene. Now, if I want to expose to the right like a good boy, all I have to do is adjust my exposure compensation, hit the button again, and then it will give me a neutral exposure based on that exposure compensation that, again, fits the scene. So hopefully this tool is something that will help everyone get out of that, uh, that rather terrible dependency habit of showing up, uh, just taking a frame, taking a look at the digital back, taking a look at the histogram, and seeing if that's right. So it could shorten the time that it takes to get that perfect exposure. So you can set this up with the exposure compensation to expose furthest to the right, um, which is probably going to be about uh, one stop, one and a half stops overexposed. Push that button, take the shot, and it should be uh, damn near perfect. So. Uh, hopefully, that's uh, one feature uh, that uh, everybody uh, can, can use, and it can improve your workflow. So if uh, you see here, just in the demo, in case it was unclear in the webcam, um, you have your manual exposure, 1 25th of a second, f11. Once you push that one-shot AE, it's going to change it to the appropriate exposure. In this case, uh, for this demo, it was 1 60th of a second at f2.8. So. A very clever feature, a uh, very uh, uh, small feature that's kind of hidden in the camera, not on by default, but hopefully something that can, again, uh, help speed up your workflow. So moving right along, so David has plenty of time to wow us with Capture One. Uh, the hyperfocal focus tool. 
So we've done a webinar before, uh, and it's in the manual, how to set up the hyperfocal focus tool. And what it is is, is pretty clear. It's, it's just a way to, at the aperture that you have uh, selected to find your hyperfocal distance. Where does the camera give me the best depth of field, focusing in infinity and focusing furthest, uh, closest to the lens, and give me that maximum depth of field without wasting it past infinity. Um, so the method to use that uh, tool is pretty simple. Um, the tool itself is a calibration tool, so you can set it up, take five frames, find the one that works the best, uh, dial in that value, take another five frames, choose the one that uh, works best, and I can go over that really briefly. Um, but the, the real advantage of the hyperfocal tool is to give you a preset saved focus point on your lens. It's a point on the lens that the camera will go to again and again and again and again every single time once that feature is turned on. So, for the purposes of this example, uh, this is an aerial shot, shot from a helicopter. Um, autofocus works 90% of the time, but I'm in a moving helicopter. Every time I activate autofocus, it's introducing variables. Will it find it? Will it not? If I'm impatient and I'm jamming the shutter button, it might not grab that perfect autofocus point, and it'll allow me to capture even though the image is soft. But with the hyperfocal focus tool, I have the ability to simply turn that feature on, push the button to activate it, and the lens will go to the exact spot. So for this example, this was shot at 1,200 12, 12, feet uh, out of a helicopter, and that is uh, infinity focus. So being in a helicopter, I have the option to use autofocus and hope that 90% of the time I'm going to have something that's in focus. Uh, I have the ability to go to manual focus and hope that my eyes and the, uh, the screen are going to give me that uh, perfect sharp focus, or on the ground, prior to being up in the helicopter, I can find where infinity is and that sweet spot of the lens, that sweet spot for focus, uh, paired with the digital back, which again, it'll be different depending on the resolution of the back. Um, and then I can just, in a snap, go to it and uh, get that nice crisp image. So I have a few examples. Uh, again, you can see on your screen the, uh, the preview window. Um, this is a blow up of 100% of that image. Um, and if we just look at that uh, image here, this is with autofocus. So I hope the, the web quality will show you um, that the autofocus is pretty damn good. You know, it's 99.9% it's .9 of the way there. But the difference between perfect sharpness um, with an IQ3 uh, 100 megapixel and almost there is night and day. So while I'm up there using autofocus, trying to find some place that's going to be contrasty enough to really tell the camera, yeah, this is it, you've nailed it, um, I can eliminate any X factors by using the hyperfocal point, finding that infinity point, uh, and then telling the camera, simply go to that location uh, and give me uh, the sharp infinity focus that I've calibrated and dialed in previously. So if we go to this next example, you can see that this is the perfect sharpness. So this image is as tack sharp as the XF IQ3 100 can give me. And again, you know, those are little tractors from this uh, full, screen, full screen image. So, if I just toggle back and forth for you guys, that's the autofocus, which was damn near there, and then this is the uh, hyperfocal point. So, how do I get there with the camera? Well, let me show you real quick. Move over here to my handy dandy webcam display. So, in the digital, uh, in, in the XF camera system menu itself, I have the ability to scroll over to my tools and find the hyperfocal uh, tool. So right now there's a question mark, and what that question mark means is that the, the camera doesn't know where the lens is. So if I simply touch that question mark, the camera calibrates and moves all the way to infinity and then back to approximately where it was and says, okay, you're at position 48. So if I use these dials here, I can move the focus. So let me do this so you can actually see the focus moving. I can move the focus in values of 10. This is 10 MCUs, motor control units, which is a movement of the motor. So I can move it just slightly um, and find that perfect infinity point, and then I can fine tune it with a value of one. So just little by little, it's dialing in that perfect point. So if we say that this is where the uh, image is in perfect infinity focus for what my application is going to be, I can simply save that value, which is now saved at 41. And then I can go into the camera menu itself. I can go to my autofocus options, and I can say, use the hyperfocal point focus. So now every time that I activate focus, I'll go into manual focus and move my focus here, and back to autofocus. Every time that I activate autofocus, the lens goes to that exact point. 
So this is, again, just a way to ensure consistency when you're taking images. For the example that I used, which is an extreme example, not everyone's going to be hanging out of helicopters, uh, unless, of course, you're lucky enough to be on our POTUS workshop in a couple of weeks in Iceland. Um, you know, this, this will give you that consistent focusing point time and time and time again, where you don't have to worry about autofocus. You know, is it tracking and I've missed my shot? Um, is there a, a seagull that's gotten in the way, or has the helicopter gone lower or higher, where you know uh, I'm going to have to shift my focus again and again and again? This hyperfocal point is just a saved preset part of the lens, a location in the lens that again, time and time again, will get me to the exact same point. So pretty helpful stuff there in terms of the uh, hyperfocal tool, and uh, again. David will go over Capture One with a, a few of the shots that show you just that uh, perfect, sweet, tack sharp uh, focus uh, when you're using the hyperfocal tool. So, moving on. Um, this brings us into the digital back uh, tools, again, available in the IQ2 and the IQ3 uh, digital backs. Um, these tools, because they live in the digital back, they're very processor heavy. Uh, so that's why it's in the IQ2 and the IQ3. Um, because it needs a lot of processing power and memory in order to read the value of the files and give you uh, an idea of what you're looking at. So we're going to go over the Exposure Zone tool, which has a, uh, uh, a map that shows you the, uh, the di distribution of the exposures. And we're going to go over the uh, Exposure Warning and the Clip Warning tool. So if we start with the Exposure Zone tool, uh, I hope everyone here is familiar with uh, Ansel Adams' zone system. Um, that is at its core exactly what this tool uh, does. So it's basically giving you a value that distributes where your exposure is in the scene. So if we're all being very diligent, good digital photographers, we're exposing to the right. And so in exposing to the right, you want to make sure that uh, you have uh, values as, fur, as far to the right, as close to 255 as possible without clipping, uh, and then the rest of the values should fall in between you know, zero, uh, 255 and 0 without going past 0 and giving you uh, just completely clipped black levels. So, once again, switching over. If we go on the digital back itself, here we have another shameless plug for POTUS workshops. I apologize. And we go to the play menu and get past those test shots. Uh, we have here uh, a scene that's a, a pretty tricky scene. Um, it was shot in a gully uh, with a little bit of daylight poking through. Now, typically, um, if I was going to you know, take the shot and I didn't have these tools available to me, I would be relying on this histogram. And this histogram is showing me that I'm very underexposed, but I have this tiny little tick here on the right-hand side. And so if we look at this scene and we turn on the zone system tool, this will distribute a mask, which again, the quality is not 100% perfect, but it is pretty good, so you get the idea. It'll distribute a mask over the image. And this mask is showing me that my values are, let's see if we can see that. Oh, here, I'll show you on the screen here. So if you notice on that preview screen in the lower right-hand corner, um, there's a little digital back display with a, a value icon on the bottom that's showing me my distribution of exposures from black to white, and then it's giving me a color for minus three and a half stops, a color for minus two, minus one, uh, green is zero because green is good, uh, yellow is plus one, and red is plus two. So red is not clipped, red is simply as close to clipped as you would possibly want to get. So this mask that's on the scene now tells me in a quick reference on the digital back, because in the field I might not have a computer handy with me, but it tells me that I've gotten all of the detail in my shadows, which is what I need, and I've just gotten a, a value of, uh, of white uh, for my sky. So if we turn this off and we go into the clip warning tool, you can see as I touch the clip warning tool, there's a blue mask that shows on the highlight uh, just up there in the sky, and that's telling me that that is the value that's clipped. So if I push this exposure any further, thinking that my shadows would be underexposed and I want to get a lot of detail, what would happen is uh, that rim of the canyon just below the sky would be blown out. The detail of the edge of that rim would be missing. But if I use that clip warning tool, I can see, if I zoom in here 100%, I can see that I have just a little hint of red. 
That's too bright. I can see that I have a little bit of red uh, in the on the edge of that exposure while the sky is blown out. So that tells me that the rim is intact. Quick reference while I'm in the field, the rim is intact, and maybe if I wanted to cheat later, I could throw in a sky. So the zone system, and I'll show you again in this example, which David will go over. Um, this is just going to put a mask on the image again to show me the distribution of the actual uh, exposure. Uh, and this, this uh, gauge down here is actually telling me uh, where my exposures are distributed. And again, just looking at this scene, which is a bit bright for you guys through the webcam, um, if I was just to look at that scene, let's see if I can bring it down a little bit for you. Not bad. If I was just to look at this scene, I would see that the, the sunset, which I was shooting directly into the sunset, is pure white, uh, and all of my shadow detail is pure black. For all intent and purposes, if I'm out in the field and this is the display that I have and this is the reference that I have for the image I've shot, um, even looking at my histogram here, I would worry that that didn't encapsulate all the detail that the back can. But using the zone system tool to give me my mask, I can see that there is, in fact, some... Uh, red and some yellow uh, above the sunset. The sunset is in fact white. Uh, and then I have just down to negative three and a half stops down here in the corner. Um, believe it or not, even though it is a webcam, even the corners are not black. Um, they are in fact, there is some viable detail in there which you can see now that I've fixed the camera a little bit. So that zone system tool is there as a quick reference for you out in the field to actually ensure that you've gotten all of the uh, information you needed at the time of capture. So again, David's going to take those two images and he'll actually show you, you know, how much latitude we had in, the, in that scene that I knew I had from referencing um, those images. So if we go here again, the clip warning tool, as I showed you uh, just a minute ago, and let me see if I can fix that exposure for you. Oh, too much. So if I look at this clip warning tool, this is the clip warning tool off, and this is the image as I see it on the digital back. When I turn on that clip warning tool, uh, like every camera, it tells me what values are above 250, let's say, with a red mask. And, and that's fair, uh, and of course every camera is going to have the ability to show you that, but if you'll notice in the dead center of that mask, there's a little bit of a blue mask. Now what that blue mask is, if I go in here to the tool, that blue color is in fact my clip warning. So my clip warning is blue. And what does clip warning mean? That means that the image itself um, has zero data in that blue mask. So if we turn that off and turn it on again, you know, from the display of the digital back, uh, I can see that there is some value in there, but it looks pretty blown out. If I look at my histogram, I can see uh, maybe I clipped some highlights, but I'm just not sure if it's perfect. So with that tool, I can turn it on and it can say, look, in that part that we're displaying is white on the digital back, yes, you are in uh, risk of overexposing. However, the only part that is really truly overexposed is this tiny little bit in the middle, this blue mask. And what's very good about this tool is uh, it is analyzing the raw data and it is telling you what is clipped on the actual raw file itself. So uh, all the other tools and uh, even the zone system tool and even the, uh, the exposure warning mask uh, are using the compressed JPEG. They're using the display JPEG that you see on the digital back to give you an approximation of where everything is. But that clip warning is actually giving you the raw data. So it's saying on the raw file there is no hope of recovering the information that is in this center which uh, I find to be very acceptable, seeing as I was shooting into the sun at sunset. Uh, that seems like a, a fair bargain to me. But that tool let me know that the only thing I was actually clipping was the sun in a sunset, which is, in my opinion, pretty fair. So it's a very good tool to have, along with the zone system, to tell you exactly what it is that you've captured, so that there's no question that you've either got the shot or you need to re-expose. If you couple that with the one-shot AE, all of those tools uh, in a line, you can very quickly know whether or not you've nailed the focus uh, and the exposure uh, of your scene, and then you can move on to the next enticing location. So um, that was the, the very brief and uh, quick rip through of these tools, but I'm going to hand it over to David, uh, and David's going to take some of those images, and we're just going to kind of talk through and illustrate uh, how those tools translate into Capture One. So David, if you're ready, 
Hey, Drew. Yo. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm All ready. right. Take it over, my friend. Okay, I'm just going to steal the screen off here. One second. Uh, and get actually the right screen up. <clears throat> okay, so you should be able to see uh, Capture One up on screen now. Should we start with this? Was the first image you had, wasn't it, Drew? Yeah, let's let's start with that one because that one, uh, you know, shows the the zone system tool, so you can actually see the distribution uh, of the of the scene. And I'm actually going to be a little tricky here. And while you're doing that, I can show the digital back display. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to because oh no, we can we can I think. I think. Possibly. Possibly. If luck is on yeah. David and I uh, are doing across the uh, the ocean, so. Yeah, I'm not sure if they'll be able to see only. I think the people will only be able to see my screen, actually. So, sadly. Um, but what we can do, of course, we can show, uh, just to prove that we're not lying, I hit the reset button up in the top left of Capture One so you can see there's no adjustments. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, how it came out on uh, camera, um, which looks pretty dark. If you can see Drew's webcam, I'm not sure if you can. I can see it, but that's probably because I'm uh, you know, a special kind of admin guy, um, but I don't think the audience will be able to, to see it, but just in case. Um, so as it came out of the camera. Oh, you can see it. You can see Drew's webcam too. Wow, the oh, amazing power work. amazing power of the internet. That's good. So that's great. We can see uh, how it looked uh, on uh, Drew's camera and how it looks uh, in, in Capture One. And of course, if you were shooting this without any additional aids, you might be tempted to think, well, I don't quite have enough shadow detail down in this area. If we look at our histogram, you see it looks you know, a bit troublesome or a bit worrying that we've got loads of data sort of piled up on the left and from mid-tones to highlights absolutely nothing but uh, and because you know, this is this is the type of scene where you would think to yourself this is a solution for HDR this is where yeah. I'll take a few frames and I'll stitch them together uh, which can be a bit of a headache um, but when you use the uh, the zone exposure tool and the clip warning tool you know exactly what you have so even when you yeah, open exactly. it up in one and it looks as David has uh, has on his screen. With the adjustments you can make, all that information can be pulled out. And uh, and of course, the data you're seeing on on the the digital back or the representation from the clip view is is not you know a guesstimate. It's inextricable inextricably linked uh, to uh, what's possible uh, in Capture One. So you know, if we just drag sort of exposure slider gently, you can really see the possibility of, of what's hiding in that image and if I just kind of go over to the right hand side uh, and reset that you see it looks like we've really got nothing but if we pull that slider across there's just an inordinate amount of data there and I guess more importantly it doesn't sort of look uh, crappy or, or uh, uh, posterized or, or unpleasant uh, just by moving up that exposure slider and as you can see that's nearly four stops that we've pulled that up, um, but ideally we could probably just do a little tweak like that. We could bring back some highlights if we wanted, and then what you did, Drew, with a little bit more time and a bit more work, if I remember correctly, is that you just had a, drawn a vague sort of gentle uh, local adjustment there, which just brought the exposure down a little bit more in that section where there was light coming from the opening at, at the top. Yeah, just to, just to remove some of that flare. And David, if you could, oh, perfect, look at you, reading my mind. So <laughs> the main point of, you know, the, the exercise of taking this image when I was out in the field um, was to make sure that the rim of this canyon was was not going to be blown out. I, you know, I want to be a good photographer and exposed to the right, um, but if I expose too far to the right, then I'm going to have the rim of that canyon be blown out. All those little trees and everything are going to be lost. So if I were to cheat. And stitch in a sky, it would be a lot of work and uh, wouldn't look as good. But with with the edge of that rim and everything there, it's very easy for me to select that, mask it, and put in some beautiful blue sky clouds if I were so inclined. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think the conclusion there, you know, without the tools, if we just re reset this one, you might be tempted to expose nearer to that, and then if we look at kind of your rim there that's totally sort of we can't see any of those 
little trees and so on. So you might be tempted to do an exposure like this, do an exposure like that, and then some kind of HDR blend. But uh, using the tools on the back, of course, we've got the ability to, to see exactly what's available uh, in the raw data and then yes. manipulate that to you know, our best intent uh, to get the final shot without having to do any tricky HDR stuff. Absolutely. And, and though I love the display of the IQ series digital backs, and it is, uh, in my opinion, the best in the business, you are working with factors like what is the brightness of the screen, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what glare do I have on it if I'm out in the field, and the, the use of those tools really eliminates any of that guesswork and, and any of those factors. So it might look quite frankly, terrible on the screen. But if you use those tools, the exposure tool and the, uh, the uh, uh, zone exposure tool, it'll tell you exactly what exposures you have, and therefore you'll know and be comfortable and, and safe that once you get these files into Capture One, everything that you want is going to be in there. Yeah, for sure. And nice. just you know, looking, looking into that shadow under there is just, you know, Unbelievable, really. <laughs> okay, so this one. So that's the same image you've got up on the camera there. Let's just yeah. prove prove that we're not a liar, and we will just reset this so that's straight out of camera. Oh, I think we've lost focus on your webcam, Drew, just so you know. So I just might want to tweak the focus a little bit, and then uh, we can see. While well, Drew's uh, futzing around with that, um, <laughs> if I zoom into the center, so as you said, Drew, was it? it's the blue, isn't it? So the very center, the blue is the sort of unrecoverable yeah. data, and then the red is, that's where in the upper echelons there, aren't we, of the unrecoverable data? Right, so on the, on the digital back display I have there, it, it shows the... The, the blue is the clipped part, the white part, uh, which would in fact be the sun, so I'm okay with that exposure being a bit clipped. And then the red is my uh, values yeah. that are uh, rolling off. So as David changes that exposure, you can see where the white part, uh, the sun itself, is actually flattening out and looking pretty horrible. Um, but everything else is pretty true to what the digital back is showing, the detail that I have. Yeah, exactly. And if we just zoom back out again, again, if you shot that, um, and you've sort of done the right exposure there, really, we're trying to preserve as much as possible, you, but you might be fooled into thinking, well, well okay, I'm in the bottom right-hand corner there. There's really no data possible. And if you just relied on the LCD screen, you would probably be convinced that, whoops, excuse me, you might then have to do another exposure here, another exposure here, another exposure here. But as you can see, if we just drop that back down a bit more, so that's how it came out of camera, and then what's actually hiding in the depths of the data is actually more than enough data uh, to uh, uh, to play with. A uh, good question, actually, Russell. While I, I just saw that, and we're looking at this, uh, do the clipping warning colours show inside of Capture One? Uh, no, they don't actually. Uh, we have the standard sort of exposure clip warning like so based on, on the RGB scale but not actually on the raw data but maybe that's, I don't know if that's possible Drew on an R&D level to bring something like, like that in but uh, it's I'm a, sure it's it is but there's a clip warning tool is really to, you know, it's a tool yeah, to get use the right the exposure, exposure I guess. Capture. So translating that into Capture One, you're, you're already going to see the parts that are clipped once you can Yeah, that's capture. true and I guess once you're in Capture One there's nothing you can do about changing the actual physical exposure, you can just manipulate uh, the raw data that is there as such. And if we go to your shot, out, Drew... We'll be pointing out the, the, the bad exposure and we don't want to rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is what you created with a few uh, local adjustment layers as well, as far as I can tell. Uh, so yep. one, two, three, four layers, just, just really stretching, pulling that, that um, data around to get to, get to that, that final result like so. Right, and again, you know, I've just adjusted the, the webcam so you guys can see, um, but yep. typically, you know, the, the shot that David's showing in Capture One, um, that's something that you would you normally look at and think, oh, i got to do that with stacking a few images and some HDR trickery. But when you capture the image and the only thing you have as reference in the field is the digital back display, using that zone tool to actually see what do I have, um, it's, it's very, very clear that the information... Um, that's 
displayed in that zone exposure tool is exactly what translates into Capture One. So even though those bottom corners were in fact uh, you know, three and a half stops underexposed, which the yeah. zone exposure tool clearly shows. Um, three and a half under three and a half uh, exposure is is plenty for Capture One to pull out those files. With yeah, dynamic not a problem. There's there's no sweat. No sweat at all. Quite. Not going to get quite those fat in the shadows. You you've got plenty of detail to work with. Yeah, and also I noticed uh, just uh, um, quite. A useful, I think it's a useful point because you've got this such wide dynamic range uh, that your white balance for the overall shot, you've actually changed it in the foreground just to warm up the front as well. So to give you that that balance between color temperature here and you've got the real warmth of the sky and so on. So I think with the t tools like that in the local adjustments, uh, not to mention uh, the ability to heap on lots of HDR as it looks like uh, you've done as well with uh, some of the layers, like the foreground layer here, uh, we yes, could open that up even more if we wanted. Um, that, as you say, negating the need to do loads of HDR stuff and blending, you know, don't really need to with the, the capabilities of the camera and mix with the capabilities of Capture One together. Right. And David, if you could, could you select both of those images, the un unadjusted one and the adjusted one, and just zoom in on the bark of that uh, tree? Bark there. of the tree? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the if the, the bark of the tree was the, the textural uh, point that I was going for in my exposure, again, if I was just referencing the digital back or even my histogram, I, I would be there for you know, quite a long time doing reference files and, and bracketing to make sure that the, the, the bark of that tree wasn't going to be silhouetted. It was still going to have texture and it was still going to have some character to it. But when I have that zone tool along with the clip warning tool, I can see exactly that that the bark of that tree is only going to be, you know, under three and a half stops. So that's certainly within the realm for Capture One to bring up, and I can bring it up even more if I want. So mm. a straight capture would have been, uh, you know, it would have had a risk of being a silhouetted tree. But with that tool, I can know in the field what's going to be possible in Capture One to pull up, which is significant. Yeah, very significant. Yeah, very significant. Uh, we should do the same shot on a, you know, few... 35 millimeter SLRs and and see what the comparison is. That would be quite interesting. Yeah, and, and again, yeah. you know, it's a lot of cameras have a lot of dynamic range, and that's excellent. For sure. But it, it's the, it's a matter of having the tools to know exactly what you captured in the field. So there's no question by the time you get back to your post processing work. Yeah. Exactly. No risk not being able to to recover something. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, next shot. That's going to be our hyperfocal shot, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. So I gave David this image just to uh, first and foremost, you know, demonstrate the, the sharpness that if you're using the hyperfocal uh, focus, um, that you're going to be able to get. Uh, again, using autofocus, it's going to work 90% of the time, but you're introducing that uh, element of chaos. You know, what happens if when you're using autofocus? Every time you activate autofocus, it's going to try and find uh, a new autofocus point, a new focus point. And if I'm in a moving object, if the ground's moving below me, um, that's not something that I want to introduce to my workflow. But having um, the sweet spot of the lens, and again, there's a difference between infinity focus and the sweet spot. Uh, the sweet infinity focus is just uh, specific to uh, the lens. That is the lens focused at infinity. But the sweet spot of the lens is going to be in a different position if I'm using a 40 megapixel, 50, 60, 80, 100 megapixel digital back. And it's going to be different if I'm shooting at f2.8, 4, 5, 6, mm -hmm. f8. Those are all going to vary slightly. And again, slightly might not affect you if you're using a 40 meg or a 50 meg digital back. But once you start using a 100 megapixel digital back, you're, that, that slightly becomes a huge factor. It becomes the, the difference between nailing that focus and, ah, I could have done better. But I don't yeah. have the money to go in the helicopter again. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. And um, yeah, so the sharpness speaks for itself. Of course, uh, I, d I don't know what that looks like on the webcam broadcast, but it's pretty, pretty damn tech sharp. And again, you've got a few local adjustments here. Uh, just a, a really nice, uh, simple trick. Um, if we just turn that off. Sorry, it's a big file, so it might might take a while to there we go uh, to kick in a, uh, to kick in and out. But just a very basic sort of gradient mask, uh, just to 
edit or just to bring back a little bit of the exposure on the, the right hand side from the slightly lower density. And if you could, David, could you just turn on the mask itself so you can see the uh, the red mask? Oh yeah. Let's just turn that on, like so. So, in this very specific example, again, uh, I realize it's not applicable to everything, but in this specific example, uh, shooting an aerial shot, uh, I knew that I wanted to have a nice even exposure. And so, with mm -hmm. the the zone tool, um, I'm able to take a shot, check the zone exposure tool on the digital back, and see that there's a variation. Uh, of the actual exposure. So if we go to mm -hmm. this shot here, you know, we can see that, that's actually this one, we can see that I have some green down here, but then I have some blue up here. And blue is going to be, you know, between negative one and negative two stops. So I can tell that this is a very uneven exposure. Now, mm -hmm. how much control I can do for the light uh, in that scenario, but I can look at it and know when I get into the capture one, I can simply apply a mask like David has in that file and even out that exposure perfectly. So that's a step that I would normally have to do in Photoshop. Uh, but with this in the RAW in Capture One, first of all, when I'm taking a shot, I know what I'm going to have to do uh, in post. And then with Capture One and the local layers adjustments, I know I can even it out simply before it's even a linear file while it's still in the RAW form. Yeah, absolutely. And then and with that, I, I took it a bit further uh, with this image and got rid of some of the, uh, the blemishes, as it were, in the shot. So well, tra tra to blemishes. Yeah. <laughs> so all these, uh, these little tractors that were down there, I wanted to make sure that I could clone those the tractor out. Uh, I didn't want it to be a part of this particular image. Not that this image is going to win any awards, but for the purpose of example, uh, it's pretty good. So uh, I knew that I wanted to remove that tractor. And again, that's something that I would typically do in Photoshop. But before the file is ever a linear file, I can do it here in Capture One and do it to, say, 90% of what I need. And so that shortens my workflow time if I'm ever going to have to deliver this file uh, as a wall size print or for a magazine, and I'm going to have to process it out and maybe retouch it based on the compression. I know that with, uh, with Capture One, I can clone out some of those things and have a starting point that is 90% of what I want as opposed to starting from zero. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and so it's not... not designed to be uh, a Photoshop style retouching tool which just designed to do simple jobs like this that uh, are just going to alleviate that sort of tedious stuff in Photoshop. Uh, if you can do it on the raw file you might as well. The quality uh, is better of course. You've got all that raw data to work with so simple things like that just make sense to do it in a Capture One. Yeah. No. And, and again, you know, with Capture One, you can do multiple layers of clones. So each one of those is just a little bit of a patchwork quilt to give me a more pleasing starting point. So it's not yep. just one and done. You know, it's uh, in Photoshop, I would have, you know, one layer with a thousand different uh, masking points on there that may or may not work. Uh, but with Capture One, I can just kind of fine tune a few here and there and kind of build the image up to be uh, the starting point that I want it to be. <laughs> and you had your hot rocks as well, didn't you? Yeah, I had, I had some hot rocks. <laughs> Just the rocks. angle of the thing just gave me a, a little bit of a, a bit of a glare. And and just while I think about, it, you see you've heaped on the dynamic, uh, sorry, the HDR tool, sort of in in that shot, just to get rid of that. And and it's worth noting if if you don't think a hundred is enough, you want to just go that bit more on the slider. Then high dynamic range is part of a layered adjustment. So any uh, additional layer you put in local adjustments, then you can heap in more. HDR control if you wish. So so you're not limited to 100 points, you can just have another layer and have another 100 points. Obviously when you reach the upper limit of the raw data then you're not going to see any difference but but um, it's certainly a good tactic if you need just that little bit more recovery on the highlights or shadows. Right, so you have a 100% in uh, shadow and highlight high dynamic range per layer. Yeah, per layer, exactly. That's That's the easy way of saying it, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, what do you well, want to look at now, Drew? A few minutes late. I think we owe you guys a few more minutes. So um, we'll just go over some of the questions that you guys had. And uh, a lot of them are uh, coming in about the hyperfocal uh, tool. Mm -hmm. um, well, first, let me tackle this one while I have the camera here. Uh, the question is can you change the colors? Uh, to determine what is your uh, exposure warning and what is your clip warning? And the answer is, of course, yes. 
So if we turn off the zone tool here, and make sure that's framed up right. So if we turn off the, the zone tool and just work with the exposure warning tool, again, red is my exposure warning limit and blue is my clipped values. If I click and hold on this tool, it brings up a menu. And in that menu, I can say anything uh, from value 255, we'll, we'll say 250, anything from 249, because I got fat fingers, uh, anything from 249 and up, it will display with the red color. But if I wanted to change that color to say be uh, green, now it's going to display that uh, exposure warning in green, and the clip warning can be in red. So if we go back to my image, now I have green as the, the clip, the exposure warning, sorry, and red as the clip warning. So if we go down here and just zoom in, we can see green is telling me that value is above 249, and the red is telling me that value does not exist. It is clipped. It is gone. There is no recovery of that value. And for this particular scene, I, I think that's just fine, <laughs> given the uh, nature of shooting into the sun. Uh, a few other questions about the uh, hyperfocal points. Um, so the question, I'm going to change my camera here so you guys can actually see me. Um, the question is, uh, do I need a specific lens for the hyperfocal tool? Um, it'll work on all newer lenses, so uh, Schneider lenses uh, and the, the new blue ring lenses. Um, and it'll, if you have an older Schneider lens, it'll remember the focal length. So if you have an 80 millimeter, it'll say if this 80 millimeter lens the hyperfocal point that they chose was this. You put on a 55, it'll know, okay, it's a 55, it should be this hyperfocal point. So each lens uh, with the focal length will be remembered by the camera. Um, but then with the blue ring lenses, you it'll remember the exact lens. So for a rental house or for somebody that, for some reason, has several lenses of the same focal length, the blue ring lenses will actually remember it's this specific lens and it's this specific uh, hyperfocal point. So you don't need any uh, special lenses. All the lenses will work. Um, but that's just the difference between the older Schneider uh, lenses and the blue ring lenses. It's just going to remember that serial number of the lens, so it's that specific lens uh, that will help you do it. Um, other questions about the hyperfocal uh, point. Um, if you are going to uh, uh, measure the hyperfocal distance, uh, it, it is a calibration. It is something you're going to have to set, shoot, and then review in Capture One, or even on the digital back, find the sharpest one, put the value of what the sharpest image is back into the camera, refine your adjustments, shoot, check, refine, 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 until you get that perfect uh, point. So it's not, uh, it's not the simplest thing to do, but it, it is there to ensure you get the best quality for that lens or that aperture. So it is very much a, a visual um, calibration over and over again. Um, can you have multiple hyperfocal points? Uh, you cannot. It is one per lens. Um, now, in the future, we might expand that, um, but for right now, it's you know that one lens at that uh, aperture is going to have that hyperfocal point. So time and time again, it's just for that one specific uh, lens, and it's that hyperfocal point for that lens, not multiple. Um, can you use hyperfocal point and autofocus together? Yes, you can. Great question. So um, as I showed. On here, switch this over for you guys. It looks a little dark there. Hang on, we can do this. Is that better or worse? That's better. So uh, on this uh, display, if you want to use a hyperfocal point, you would go to. I have to have a lens on it. That would help. Great job, Drew. <laughs> so when I have a lens on the camera, it knows that my hyperfocal point is 41 for this specific camera, or for the specific lens. I can go in here to my focus options and say go to the hyperfocal point. And again, every time that I activate autofocus, it goes to that point. So the autofocus uh, function, which is my half press here, is now going to that hyperfocal point. But on the digital back itself, if I were going to use both, I have this option here, autofocus on the digital back. So I don't have a lens attached for it, so it won't work without a lens. But that button there will activate autofocus. It will not honor your hyperfocal point. 
So you can use this to use autofocus and find focus in a scene, and then you can use whichever button you wish uh, to activate autofocus on the camera body. And with that option turned on, this option here, uh, yeah, the lens again. With this option here, it'll go to your hyperfocal point. So it's how you can combine both of those um, in the camera system itself. Um, so the hyperfocal point um, should really be uh, saved for your uh, sweet spot of the of the lens. So what is the sweet spot of the lens? Um, that's going to be different for every single lens, even the same uh, focal length. It's going to be different for every digital back. Um, so you want to set it up for your specific setup, uh, and you want to set it up for you know f8 to f11, depending on the back, uh, just to account for diffraction. If you have a higher resolution digital back, it's probably going to be closer to uh, f8. If you're at a lower resolution back, you can probably get away with uh, f11, f12, f13, maybe sometimes. Um, so you're going to have to do some trial and error to figure out which one is that perfect sweet spot. Uh, and again, you, you'll be able to tell, trust me, when you get it, because there is uh, there is in focus and sharp, and then there is dynamite, pin sharp, cut glass, perfection. So any other questions about uh, what we went over today? Uh, one shot AE does work with uh, manual mode, works with all modes. And again, the one shot AE feature, you can assign that to a specific button on the XF camera body. And you can tell the camera system which uh, functions you want to change shutter speed, ISO, aperture. Um, and it's going to uh, give those a hierarchy. So shutter speed will change first. And if shutter speed cannot change within the limits that you've set, it'll go to aperture. And then it'll change your aperture, and if that can't change, then it'll go to ISO. The last thing it wants to change is your ISO. Um, that's pretty much it. Can you use clip warning with leaf credo backs? Uh, no, you can't. Uh, again, it, it is something that the IQ2 and the IQ3 have in them because it requires all that processing power. Um, so those are the two lines of digital backs that will offer the clip warning and the exposure uh, tool. Um, and Craig says it's split screen is cool. I think it's cool too, Craig. Thank you. Um, all right, so that uh, clears it up. If there's a if there's a question that was maybe off the topic a little bit in here, I'll be, make sure to get back to you uh, personally uh, via email. Uh, but uh, I hope that everyone learned something today about the uh, the XF, the IQs, and uh, David's expert tutelage in Capture One. So if you have any other questions about Capture One. Uh, David's got webinars every week and goes over pretty much yep, whatever correct. is on David. Yeah, I think the, the next webinar is going to be the 30th, uh, which I've got a guest, actually. So if you go to our events page uh, and then you'll look at webinars, then it's got all the dates for upcoming webinars right through till uh, end of July, I think. Sounds good. Yeah. We'll be there, of course. <laughs> good. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, at the end of this webinar, I'm just going to put up a, a poll. So if you could, before you log out, if you could just answer one of the questions, just asking what you guys want to see more of uh, in the hardware webinar series. Uh, David and I, I think we've got this pretty much dialed in. He's, of course, in the UK. I'm in Denmark. Uh, but through the power of the internet, we're making it happen. We've got quite a significant rig here with the webcam and the TV screen and the, the other webcam for the camera system. So. Um, we can pretty much do whatever you guys need us to do, um, and uh, if you can get back to us and let us know what you want to see more of, we'll be sure to model the next few after that so everyone's satisfied and everyone's happy and everyone learns something. So, yep. thank you all for joining. Much appreciated, um, and uh, hope to see you again soon. All right. Cheers. Take care, everyone.